Welcome to our Bible study time. Our memory verse is in the book of Colossians, chapter 3, and verse 9. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds. There's a scripture song for part of this verse. Lie not one to another, lie not, lie not, lie not one to another. Colossians 3 verse 9. All right, Stephanie, do you want to try it? Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds. Yes. Colossians 3 verse 9. Excellent. Yes. All right. Corey, do you want to try? Okay. Lie not one to another. Lie not one to another. Seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds. Seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds. Colossians 3 verse 9. Colossians 3 verse 9. Excellent. Yeah. One way that you can memorize is to have someone reading it and then you echo it. That's one way. Yeah. And then another way that I like to do is write out the first letter of every word with the punctuation. Uh, that method is, is helpful, especially if you're by yourself memorizing and you don't have someone else right. to read it and have you echo it. The reason why I haven't memorized is because I told a lot of lies when I was little. And uh, so one of the punishments for that was that my mom would have me write this verse or other verses about telling the truth. And I would write them over and over and over and over and, you know, 25 times or 50 times or, you know. So, um, yeah, it, it's uh, that's one reason why it's in here. Yeah, go ahead and spot me there and just make sure I don't make a mistake. Okay. Um, lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 9. Okay. Perfect. All right. Yes. Uh, all right. Yes, let's pray. Uh, thank you for reminding me. Our Father in heaven, we are thankful that we have a time to spend in nature and we have time to spend studying your word and memorizing your word. Please, Father, speak to us through the word. Teach us through the word. Give us the strength that we need to apply what we have learned into our lives. Thank you. We need so much your teaching, your instruction. You're the teacher. We are the students, so we're ready for you to come and teach us. We ask also that you would drive Satan and his evil angels away, that they would have no access here, and that you will put your hand of protection over the recording. Thank you. We ask in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. We are going to be reading from Genesis chapter 25. And we're going to be looking at verses 27 through 37. Genesis chapter 25, 27 through 37. And the boys grew, and Esau was a cunning hunter, a man of the field, and Jacob was a plain man dwelling in tents. And Isaac loved Esau, because he did eat of his venison. But Rebekah loved Jacob, and Jacob sawed pottage. In other words, cooked soup. And Esau came from the field, and he was faint. And Esau said unto Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage, for I am faint. Therefore was his name Edom. And Jacob said, Sell me this day thy birthright. And Esau said, Behold, I am at the point to die. And what profit shall this birthright do to me? Jacob said, Swear to me this day. And he sware unto him, and he sold his birthright unto Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils. And he did eat and drink, and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. We 
We are on page 20. As the twins grew up, there was a big difference in how they acted. Esau, the oldest or firstborn, lived to hunt and roam the fields and woods. Jacob, the youngest or the secondborn, liked to stay close at home. They were different in how they thought. Esau was selfish and lived for himself each day. He did not like restraint, but liked the life of a hunter, wild and roving. Isaac loved Esau. Jacob was a quiet, peace-loving shepherd who also tilled the soil. He was thoughtful, diligent, careful, and ever thinking about the future. His patient perseverance, thrift, and foresight were valued by the mother, Rebekah. He brought happiness to his mother's life. She loved Jacob. These boys were taught that a birthright was very important. It was an inheritance of wealth, but more importantly, it meant being the spiritual leader of the family. Through this family, many years later, Jesus the Redeemer was to be born. The one having the birthright would give his life to God's service. Esau did not value the birthright. He did not want the law of God to rule him. Jacob valued the birthright, but he needed to have a change in his heart. He set about trying to work out in his own way the ownership of the birthright. Now we are going to read Genesis chapter 25, and we're going to look at verses 29 through 34. And Jacob sawed pottage, and Esau came from the field, and he was faint. And Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage, for I am faint. Therefore was his name called Edom. And Jacob said, Sell me this day thy birthright. And Esau said, Behold, I am at the point to die, and what profit shall this birthright do to me? And Jacob said, Swear to me this day. And he sware unto him, and he sold his birthright unto Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils. And he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Hmm. So, Jacob used some leverage to get the birthright. Uh, some people might consider that stealing. Esau was so hungry, and his brother Jacob says, Well, if you'll sell me your birthright, then you can have this food. And definitely not kind definitely not the thing to do and Esau was hungry enough that he made the deal so God wanted Jacob to trust him that he would obtain the birthright in God's time and in God's way but Jacob did not trust God at that point enough to let God work in his time and his way. So he tried to make a deal. And it wasn't a kind one. It wasn't considerate. God was well able to work out the problem of who would receive the birthright. Jacob had traits in his character that he needed to overcome. Two of these areas were stealing and untruthfulness. One other very important lesson that Jacob needed to learn was to trust God. Jacob had said to Rebekah that the elder son, Esau, shall serve the younger son, Jacob. Jacob did not believe that the promise concerning himself could be fulfilled so long as Esau retained the rights of the firstborn. He did not believe in the truthfulness 
of God's Word. Okay, so we have some review questions. What was Esau's special skill? What was he really good at? Yeah. Or what was he known for? Do you remember? Yeah, I mean, I think... Yeah, Esau was... Yeah, I mean, I think that his special skill was his ability to connect with nature. Well, the the Bible just says he was a, a, a cunning hunter, so he liked to go hunt. Right. And so, uh, in order to hunt, yeah, you would have to connect with nature. What was Jacob's special skill, according to what we read? I didn't catch that. Okay, yeah. that's fine. Uh, sometimes I read the Bible and I don't catch it. I don't. I don't get it. <laughs> And that's okay. Wait, can I uh. say what I did get out of it? Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, what I got out of it is that um, there's times when you feel like you know what you want to do and you hear the right voice in your head telling you, you know, this is the way and here's what, you know, the best option for you is to do. But at the time, it sounded like Jacob wasn't listening to that voice. And instead, he chose to take another route. Mm -hmm. So he made a choice to not listen to that, which mm -hmm. I think everybody makes mistakes. Oh, definitely. Yeah. And it's understandable. Mm -hmm. But I also think that the importance that I got from it is just to listen to that voice mm -hmm. and follow it mm -hmm. to make the right decisions. That's mm -hmm. what I got from mm -hmm. that. that yes. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so... We know what Esau's special skill was. He was a, a hunter out in the field, out in the woods. What was Jacob's special skill or what, what ability did he have or what life work did he choose? He was a shepherd and he also tilled the soil. Yes. So he had flocks and he had herds. Yes. And... Why did Isaac especially love Esau? Isaac is the dad. Esau is the firstborn son. And according to what we read, what did Esau do for his father that his father really liked? ate his venison, so yes. I guess that they were both hunters and they shared that in common and so it created a bond between the two of them. I see, yes, yes. So uh, Isaac really liked to eat the meat that his son went out and snared or somehow bagged. Yep. And why did Rebecca especially love Jacob? Well, from what we read here, it looks like Jacob was pretty obedient and um, Esau was not. So she would be more inclined to that because he also had these other um, character qualities that she liked, such as perseverance, thrift, and foresight. Mm, okay. So that created a bond between the two of them. Mm -hmm. I see. Yes, and it sounds like probably Esau would have been gone on maybe long hunting trips out in the field, out in the woods, far from home, and Jacob would have been staying closer to home, working on the farm. Uh, so, like for me, when I'm gardening and farming, I'll be home day after day after day after day after day, but... If I was a hunter, I might go on a week-long hunting trip and I might you know, be gone for a while. So there was a special bond with Rebecca and with Jacob, and partly of that was just the fact of, of time spent together. Mm -hmm. How would we describe Esau's character and how would we describe Jacob's? Was there a difference? Would you say that, based on what we've read, would you say that there's a difference between the two and their character? Yeah, I mean, I think the initial difference that I noticed is that Esau, I think he kind of liked 
you know, he had more independency and he wanted to do things like kind of his own way. Mm -hmm. And Jacob, he kind of liked to be a good team player and follow mm -hmm. along. So I think that was the difference mm -hmm. that I noticed. Yeah, I would say that, that based on what we read, that that would be accurate. We notice here that Esau was selfish and just living for himself. And then we see that Jacob was more quiet and more peace-loving. And when we read more into the story, we'll see that Esau was more of a warrior, more of a fighter, and Jacob was more like his dad, more peaceable. Um, I'm not sure if we're going to cover this in the lesson, but if we read further in God's Word, there's a story of how Isaac had dug wells, and then neighbors who were not believers in the true God would say, this is my well. And they would claim a well that, you know, it takes so much time and, and hard work to dig a well. And they would just say, this is my well. And so then Jacob would dig another well. And then they would claim that well. And then he would dig a well and then they would fill it in. And instead of fighting them, instead of hating them, he would just dig another well. And then eventually they got what they wanted and then Isaac had the wells that he needed and then there was peace. That nature of being peaceable and uh, being forbearing, being perseverant, that was something that Isaac had. And then his son Jacob kind of inherited more of that kind of nature, that kind of character. So when I previously heard this story, I thought that it said that God promised that Jacob would have the birthright. But what we read here, the promise was that the elder will serve the younger, and they assumed that that meant that Jacob would be the one that receives the gift of the birthright. Mm -hmm. Yes, well, in, in the elder brother serving the younger that would definitely imply that Jacob would have the birthright and not Esau. It's interesting to try to think like how would God have solved this problem because they saw only one way of this becoming true but if they wouldn't have been deceitful it would be interesting to know how it actually would have turned out. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Well, our Creator, our Master, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, while, while He does not force the will, He is a Master of Circumstances, and His will is done as He sees best. We are going to have our nature study time. Exoskeleton. The body of an insect has a tough outer shell for covering called an exoskeleton. This is lighter and stronger than bone and protects the internal organs. If Jacob would have trusted God, he would have given him the birthright. As the exoskeleton protects the insect's body, so God would have protected the birthright for Jacob. Jacob would never have needed to steal or be untruthful to get it. The law of God, like the exoskeleton, protects our happiness, and it says, Thou shalt not bear false witness, and thou shalt not steal. Exodus chapter 20, verses 16, and also verse 15. As you work together as a family, do your chores in truthfulness and do not steal. So when you take the trash out, if you're a young man or a young woman, maybe you're 10 or 12 years old or maybe a little older, if you're taking the trash out, don't waste time playing around and then tell your mother an untruth about why you took so long. That would be stealing time and then lying about it. 
So if you have the opportunity, let's look for insects and use an insect guide to identify them. And we're encouraged to plan a meal with lentils, like make lentil stew, and then we can remember about this lentil stew that Jacob made and then Esau wanted it. Esau had a special strong desire for a particular article of food, and he had gratified self so long that he did not feel the necessity of turning from the tempting coveted dish. He thought upon it and made no special effort to restrain his appetite until his power bore down every other consideration and controlled him, and he imagined he would suffer great inconvenience and even death if he could not have that particular dish. The more he thought upon it, the more his desire strengthened, until his birthright, which was sacred, lost its value and its sacredness. He thought, well, if I sell it now, I can easily buy it back again. When he sought to purchase it back, even at a great sacrifice on his part, he was not able to do so. He sought for repentance carefully and with tears. It was all in vain. He had despised the blessing, and the Lord removed it from him forever. Wow. That's sad. This talking about having such a strong desire for food um, made me think about some of the things that people eat and how those particular foods can cause you to have these type of animal-like passions where you have trouble controlling yourself. Mm -hmm. And so because of the food that he ate, he wasn't able to control himself and then he had this... Um, unquenchable desire for those things mm -hmm. yes oftentimes we may know that the cancer in the can coca-cola is not good for us or we may know that the mountain dew is not good for us or we may know that a particular kind of food is not good for us when we eat it anyway where we may think, oh, this is a small thing, but it, it can develop a habit in us where we know that this is not best for me, but I'll do it anyway. And once we create this pattern or this established habit, then it can affect how we make bigger choices in our life. So for a young person who's considering getting married, you may meet someone and you may see red flags and maybe your parents or trusted friends tell you this is not the this is really not the best one for you, you there's someone out there that's that's a lot better for you and you may have been settling for less you may have been making choices that you know are not best for you and you've made a habit of just impulsively doing what you know is not best for you because that's what you want to do. Some of these junk foods, they taste good in the moment, they feel good in the moment, but later they give you cavities. In the moment they feel good, they taste good, but you get diabetes. They taste good in the moment, taste good, it feels good in the moment, but then you get heart disease. And so you may think that it doesn't really matter what you eat. It does. Ask God to show you and, and study and find out what is healthful, what is good for me to eat. So once you, in the small things of what you eat in your diet, you develop this habit of instead of settling for what's not good or instead of just eating what tastes good in the moment. I remember thinking, oh, I don't want to eat these greens. Ugh, these greens taste horrible. And mom would say, well, you need them for your bones. Yeah, this will help you have strong bones. And no, I don't want to eat them. Then I was really young and mom said, okay, well, um, once you eat these healthy food, your vegetables, then you can have the other food like peanut butter and, and 
bananas, you know, and, and that you really like. And I remember sitting there pouting. And Mom said, well, you have a little perch there. A little birdie could perch on your lip, you know. And uh, I, I just was not, not happy at all. But then she's like, you know, after you eat this, then you can eat your healthy food. And so I was stubborn, but mom was more stubborn. And so eventually I would eat the healthy food, the vegetables and things. And then I started getting a habit in it. And then when I was about 14 years old, I decided I'm, I will choose to like anything that I know is healthy for me. So now I can truthfully say that all the healthy food, all the vegetables, all the fruit, I like them. I like them. Uh, now there are some that I would have a preference over another, some that I don't like quite as well, but I can truthfully say that I like the taste of all the food that's out there, that's healthy for me. So say you are like Esau and you are having trouble restraining yourself. Um, there's two things that I'd recommend you do. The first one we talked about a couple lessons ago, and that was being mindful of your screen time and not making it to where your limbic system grows larger than your prefrontal cortex. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that I would advise you to do is stay away from eggs, dairy, cheese, and meat, especially meat that's not kosher, that still has the blood in it, because mm -hmm. all of those items feed your animal-like passions in your body and make it harder to make good decisions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of the meat that's out there, they don't drain all the blood out because uh, they get paid per pound. And so if you drain all the blood, then you get less pounds, you get less money. So uh, definitely that's important if you are going to eat meat, make sure it's clean meat and, you know, that it, uh, a clean animal would have a split hoof and chew the cud. So like sheep, goats, cows, deer, those would be clean animals. Um, but the pig would have a split hoof, but it does not chew the cud. So a pig would be considered unclean. And those were those laws in the Old Testament were not just a ceremonial law that was only for the Jews. Those are for our good, that's for our health. So if you do choose to eat meat, make sure that it's according to those specifications in Leviticus. But there's really no need to eat meat. I've never eaten any meat in my life except for just to taste it. You can get all your protein, all your vitamins and minerals in a well-balanced plant-based diet. Uh, and so a lot of health benefits for a plant-based diet. They put growth hormones a lot of times in the meat today. And so uh, those growth hormones can actually cause people to have more uh, sexual type of desires. Mm -hmm. And we live in a world with lots of sexual temptations. So um, having a plant-based diet can actually help you in your, your battle, your, your pursuit of holiness and purity, following God's plan for your life the diet actually makes a huge difference. So if you have self-control in diet and you're looking at what you eat and you're like, okay, I want to eat what's best for me so that body can be healthy so I can serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Once you are surrendered to the Lord and your appetites with what you eat, uh, then it will also follow that your desires, your sexual desires, you are going to Instead of just fulfilling those anytime you feel like it's best, you're going to say, okay, Lord Jesus, I'm living for you. And so you're the one who said that we save this until we're married. We, you're the one who said that we keep this within the marriage covenant and not outside. And so when you're surrendered within your appetites of what you eat, the food that you eat, then it also follows that your other desires, your other passions will also be in accordance with God's will. So you may think that it doesn't really matter what you eat, it does. The little decisions that we make, the little habits that we form, they have a bearing ultimately in the big major decisions that we make. So you might not have seen one of the older lessons where we talk about the prefrontal cortex and the limbic system, so I'll put a link in the description to a series called Media on the Brain and it explains the different types of media and how videos like this are not making your limbic system grow, but 
movies or other entertainment does. Mm -hmm. Also, if you're going to start making changes in your diet, I recommend starting with cutting out cheese first because it's the most harmful mm -hmm. because it's so concentrated. Mm -hmm. Yes. Also, um, there's a video that we did called the 10 day challenge. And we explain more about the reasons why we have a plant-based diet. You'll go to the channel called Henson Creek House of Prayer. And then it's a video titled The 10 Day Challenge. And so we explain more in depth about the principles uh, that we have found to be a blessing for us. I'm really grateful that my parents raised me the way that they did. And never having soda pop ever in my life, uh, except for when I was 14 and a neighbor offered it to me and I didn't like the taste of it. I just don't have as many cravings for things that aren't healthy because I never developed a taste for it. Mm -hmm. um, never having a filling, it, you know, not having to go to the dentist. I've not been to the dentist since I was 17. A lot of blessings. Never taken pain medication. Um, never taken antibiotics. Um, had a surgery where they went into the bone and put a plate in there and then I wouldn't take the antibiotics that they prescribe and they're like well you could get an infection in your bone and you could potentially have to amputate your foot in order to keep infection from spreading and they were just very adamant that you need to take the antibiotics and I'm just grateful that God gave me peace about it and I told them, oh garlic is a natural antibiotic it's a natural blood thinner so we're gonna do the natural ways that God has given us and then we're gonna trust it in his hands and healed up beautifully uh, I'm not telling you what you have to do, but I'm telling you that God's plan, His ways, they do work, and I'm evidence of it. Anything else that the Lord laid it on your heart to share? Yeah. Okay, go ahead, uh, Brother Corey. <laughs> I can agree that happiness to me, it boils down to three things. Physical health, mental health, and gratitude. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> and I think it's interesting that I, I'm paraphrasing, but in there it said that you're, the exoskeleton protects your happiness. Mm. And so the exoskeleton, in my perception, is my exterior body. And just like you guys are saying, if you treat it well by eating food that God has given us mm. and not giving it these you know, chemicals, drugs, mm -hmm. and man-made harmful digestive materials, yes. then it helps to protect your happiness. And I can attest that mm -hmm. I'm also very grateful for my mom. She raised me in a way where on Halloween, instead of going out and getting candy to eat it, we would give it to her and she would give us money for it. Oh, wow. And we would throw the candy away. Oh, wow. Praise so, the Lord. <laughs> well, I, I agree with you. You know, yeah. it's very mm -hmm. important to eat mm -hmm. healthy. Mm -hmm. And by having a healthy body, it helps to have a healthy mental yes. capacity uh, yes. and also be grateful. So those three things are what make me happy in life, and they all help each other. But definitely starting with a diet is a mm -hmm. great, mm -hmm. great thing to do. Definitely. So I agree with you guys. Yeah. Definitely, yeah. yeah. Appreciate your input there, Brother Corey. Yeah. But yeah, sure. Well, I raised my kids very natural with no artificial anything, and the least process I could get, and I did a lot of cooking, and so did they. But um, we didn't have a real religious household, but I told them that we eat God's food, and that is what I do, and that's how I connect with God, is how is what I put in my body in the majority. Sometimes it's hard when you have to go out with friends or you want to go out with people and they go into a restaurant, you do the best you can, but when I go home, all that's in my house is good food. So mm -hmm. um, I appreciate this scripture reminding people that it is really important to eat what God provides for you because that's the best thing there is and it will keep you healthy. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Appreciate that. I did not grow up with these kind of recommendations and I made the changes later. So I grew up eating meat and dairy and everything. And then when I learned that those things were not good, I started cutting them out. And then like she was talking about, I would get invited to go out to eat or get invited to have supper at someone's home. And so what I would do when I would go to a restaurant is I would drink water. Or if I was invited to someone's house for supper and they had good healthy food, I would say, you know, I don't eat this late at night, but is it okay if I take some with me? So that's something that you could do too. That way you're 
um, not missing out on the meal, but yet still keeping your convictions in order. Yes. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Yes, I believe I shared this this point on the the lesson we did on the 10 day challenge um, that was back a while back on the Henson Creek House of Prayer channel. But, you know, I wanted to get as much work done as I could. So I'd be working during daylight hours. And then right before I go to bed, I'd be really hungry. So I'd eat and eat and eat and eat and eat. And then I'd go to bed and then my stomach wouldn't be happy. And then I would be really tired. And the next morning I had to wake up to get work done. But I, I just, I couldn't wake up early. I was just so tired, and so then I wasn't wasn't spending time in God's presence in prayer and in His Word, and so I was really failing, like in my walk, and just I was struggling with depression, and I and just I wasn't close to the Lord, and then um, I started going back to how I was raised. I was raised with a big breakfast, a big lunch, no snacking in between, and then. We didn't usually eat anything for the third meal. It was uh, maybe some fruit. And we would go to bed on a completely em empty stomach. And so your body can rest the best when the stomach is empty. So the stomach can rest when the rest of the body is resting. It now, just eating big breakfast, big lunch, no snacking. Now, when I go to sleep, my stomach is at rest. My stomach feels good. The Holy Spirit will wake me up in, early in the morning and sometimes I come out in the woods early in the morning or just spending time in the Bible and in, in God's presence early in the morning. And I couldn't be doing what I'm doing now with these messages, praying with people, helping them connect with God if I was eating with the schedule that I was. Schedule is really important um, so your stomach can rest and so you'll you'll find that you get closer to God. If your stomach is clogged and unhappy, then your mind is clogged and unhappy. So when your stomach is, is happy and everything's moving properly, then your mind will be clear and then you can read God's Word Then you can connect with Him in nature and you'll grow mentally, you'll grow spiritually, you'll, you'll be better emotionally and ultimately physically you'll be benefited as well. Right, we have a poem. The boy that told a lie. The mother looked pale and her face was sad. She seemed to have nothing to make her glad. She silently sat with a tear in her eye, for her dear little boy had told a lie. He was a pleasant, affectionate child. His ways were winning, his temper was mild. There was joy and love in his soft blue eye. But oh, this sweet boy had told a lie. He sat by the window alone within, and he felt that his soul was stained with sin. And his mother could hear him sob and cry, because he had told her that wicked lie. Then he came and kneeled by his mother's side, and asked for a kiss, which she denied. And he told her, with many a penitent sigh, that he never would tell another lie. Then she took his small hands between her own and bade him before her kneel gently down and kissed his cheek while he looked on high and prayed to be pardoned for telling a lie. Let's close our study time now with prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that we are learning from this lesson, from what Jacob and Esau did. We're learning how Jacob had took this situation in his own hands. He made a deal. And Father, we make that same mistake sometimes, but we want you to teach us. We want to learn not to do that, not to take things into our own hands, but when you have promised us something, let us wait and let you work it out in your time and your way. Please bless each of those who are studying with us, those that are here, those that are joining us online, on YouTube. Bless us all 
that we can be a blessing. We ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus, Yeshua. Amen.